The last few weeks, we have spent time, as you'll remember, considering what fellowship is, and especially how beneficial it is for us. But fellowship brings some hazards to our lives, along with its blessings. We need to be aware and on guard of, against these hazards, be aware that they exist. They are present because fellowship is a relationship between sinners, and a relationship between sinners always carries potential for pain and sorrow because I'm a sinner and you're a sinner and when we get, our, get together, we multiply our chances of something uh, being done wrong. And tonight, we're going to consider what I've called the dangers of fellowship. The dangers of fellowship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for fellowship and we thank you for all of the blessings that you give to us but Lord, all we have to do is look around us and see the natural world that you created and how it has been perverted and twisted and corrupted by sin. It is a sad truth that all of the good things that you, that you wrought and, and brought about through the creation can be corrupted and twisted and violated by our sin. And that includes fellowship. Lord, help us not to have our fellowship corrupted. Help us not to ruin it or twist it or, or pervert it. I pray that you would help us to be aware of these things and these, this potential. I just pray that you'd speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. The last few weeks we've talked about the ingredients of fellowship and how it's basically a league or a partnership between two people. That would be a basic way to describe it. This partnership is found in common priorities or objectives. We have a shared belief system or a shared occupation or a shared objective, and these are all examples of a basis for fellowship. We've looked at the importance of fellowship and how we need it as humans and as Christians. Fellowship is important as an identifier, not only for us to identify things about ourselves or about others, but for others to identify things about us with whom we fellowship shows the kind of person we are. You can't fellowship with someone unless you have something in common with them. And fellowship is important also because it helps us get our focus off of self and on to others and their needs. Last week, we looked at many blessings of fellowship and how fellowship can make our lives much more fulfilling and joyful. True Christian fellowship has a lot to offer us. It adds a lot to our lives, but it comes with potential for harm as well. And that's what we're going to see tonight. First of all, I want us to see defeat from fellowship. Defeat from fellowship. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, of course we know basically what what the epistle, the first epistle to the Corinthians was all about. Paul wrote a lot of things. He included a lot of doctrine, but, but there was a lot that needed correcting in that church in Corinth. And, and so if we had to choose a theme for that epistle, maybe that would be it, just to correct wrong behavior. And in chapter 9, Paul talks about faithfulness to Christ for the gospel's sake. That is why we need to be faithful to Christ, because because the gospel is then uh, empowered. We, we are able to be used in the work of the gospel and souls can be saved because of that. And in chapter 11, he talks about God-ordained authority and communion between believers. And in between those two chapters, in chapter 10, we find him dealing with many issues relating to what I've called the dangers of fellowship. Fellowship can be dangerous because it can it can be the environment that ushers in our defeat. And again, when we, when we say, you know, uh, people corrupted what God made and turned it into a sinful thing, that's not God's fault. God, it, so, and God created fellowship. So if fellowship has this part, this influence in our lives, it's not God's fault. Uh, fellowship as God intended and as God designed it is still a good thing, but it can be, it can be twisted and it can be used 
to violate and, and bring us to defeat. And so we are wise to learn from the lessons and learn lessons from the mistakes of others so that we do not have to learn these lessons from experience. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So Paul is making some spiritual applications here, but the point that he's making is all of those Jews all went through the same things. They all came out of Egypt. They all went through the Red Sea. They all drank from the rock. They all ate manna together. They had a lot of things in common. This is the basis of fellowship, these things in common. All the Hebrews saw God work. They had so much in common, but there was a big, a major fatal difference between those Hebrews within that group. Look at verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And you think about all God did for them. Why would he, you know... Why, why would he go to all that trouble to deliver them? He, he was not well pleased. So there, as a nation, God had his hand on those people. They were his chosen people. He had seen their, their sorrow and their anguish, as he says to Moses in Exodus. And he says, I've seen the, the, the suffering of my people. I'm going to rescue them. He plagued Egypt. He did all of these things for these people. But that didn't mean that all of them in that group followed the Lord. It says, with many of them, God was not well pleased. Again, I want us to see the similarities that all of these people shared with each other. They were all Jews. They were all Hebrews. They were all former slaves. They were all God's chosen people. But spiritually, they were very different. And as we seek to um, fellowship with others, I think that we all want to, to make good choices in that way. Who do I fellowship with? Who do I not fellowship with? This is, we've talked about this. What is fellowship based on? Well, it's based on similarities. What kind of similarities? Well, if it's, if it's biblical, godly fellowship, it ought to be based on spiritual and biblical similarities. It ought to be based on a shared purpose. And so we cannot fellowship with the world, they, we do not have the right things in common. And so one, of the, one area in which we might, where we might look and say, oh, we have things in common would be blessings from God. Look, they're, they're being blessed by God just like I, like I am. And these Hebrews could have looked around and said, we, we've all seen God's deliverance. We've all seen God's blessing. And I want us to see, first of all, the blessings from God are not the same as relationship with God. This fruit in someone's life that we might look at and, and try to discern, is, is, this a, is this a basis for fellowship? Well, I mean, they seem to be successful just like me. They seem to have God's blessing on their life just like me. So that must be, that must be my, my confirmation here. That's normal. It's natural to look for these things. It's good for us to look for fruit, to examine fruit. The Lord the Lord tells us to do that, but sometimes I think we can assume that just because someone appears to be blessed, that means that they're godly. That means that, that they follow the Lord. But this is not a reliable connection to make because Matthew 5.45, Christ says, for he, speaking of the Father, maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. James talks about having no respect of persons and saying to someone who is wealthy, oh, you sit up here in this honored place and saying to someone who is poor, oh, you sit down in this, in this place that's, that's not a place of honor. That's respecting persons because of their wealth, for instance. And we can look at that maybe and, and determine that God is blessing someone because they are financially prosperous. And these Hebrews could have looked around and said, well, we've all, you know, we're, we're all together on this. We've all got a lot in common. That must mean we're all the same spiritually. But as we'll see in this chapter, 
that was not the case. In Psalm 73, Asaph is, is writing this. He's speaking and he says in verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. He was becoming envious, and he knew these people were foolish. He knew these people were wicked, but he was becoming envious at their success. They're, they're so strong, they're so successful, they're so prosperous. Why can't I be like that? And he was envious at this while even he knew that there wasn't fellowship between them. He was defining wicked, the, the word wicked, by something other than prosperous. And we ought to do the same. If we don't, we might fellowship with people who have many blessings in common with us, but who do not walk with God. And if we fellowship with people who do not walk with God, that will threaten our walk with God. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That communications means the, the, the association with other people. We associate with evil. It corrupts our, our good manners, our, our, our godly way of life. We should not be deceived about this. Galatians 5, 9 says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And I find it striking that Paul makes a point in 1 Corinthians 10 that, they were all, that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. They were part of this group, but they were not pleasing God. We know that relationship with God cannot coexist with sin. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. How do we choose to fellowship with those who walk with God and avoid fellowship with those who whose lives can bring defeat to our lives. Again, how do we choose to fellowship with people who have the, important, the most important things in common with us? How do we know who is who? How do we know which is which? Well, we need to compare their conversation, their lifestyle, their choices with the Word of God. Because if we have sin in our life, that, re that interrupts our relationship with the Lord and... And if we live that way, we're going to start affecting others in a negative way as well. This is why being part of a body, part of a, part of a church, if you aren't walking with the Lord, if you're running from God, if you're straying from Him, if you're neglecting your walk with God, you have a negative impact on those around you. It's, it is, a, it is a, a negative effect on the body because we're all connected. We're, we're, all, we're all connected to each other. If you walk with the Lord, you have a positive effect. If I walk with the Lord, I have a positive effect on, 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 my, on my church. And we ought, to, we ought to ask the Lord to use us in our church to have a positive effect on each other. And so how do we, how do we fellowship with the right people and, and not fellowship with, with the wrong people, if you want to put it that way? There are a lot of people in our world that, that we might consider fellowshipping with. And sadly, sometimes, even within a church, we can see that there are some significant differences sometimes, and we have to make those choices. And I'm not, I'm not thinking of anything, I'm not addressing anything going on here. I'm just, I'm just dealing with an issue overall, something for us to be aware of. I'm not, I'm not considering anyone or anything at this particular moment. It's just considering the issue here, but it's good for us to understand how we approach this topic of fellowship. First of all, I want us to see that when we compare choices with the Word of God, Paul talks about we need to be aware of a lust for the wrong things. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 6. It says, Now these things were our examples. This was given for us to pay attention to. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. There were... 
There was a group that were all participating and experiencing these things, but many of them lusted after evil things, a lust for the wrong things. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 11, and we'll see what Paul is talking about here. Numbers chapter 11. And sadly, there are many bad examples that we find in this period of the nation of Israel, but it's helpful for us because you and I have the same sinful nature. We have the same sinful tendencies and the same potential to do these things. Numbers 11, verse 4, it says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away, and there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat, or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Why were they ungrateful for this? Verse 10, then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses also was displeased. These people were weeping because they couldn't be in Egypt with all the food that was in Egypt. They were lusting. Now, is it wrong to eat meat and cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic? No, it's not wrong to eat those things. Is there anything wrong with desiring those things and, and eating, well, I would say... Generally, no, but yes, if we desire those kinds of things more than what the Lord's provided for us. If we say, Lord, you gave us this manna, and it's, it's wonderful and everything, because the Bible tells us it was, it was wonderful, but we don't like this anymore. We would rather have what we want. We don't want what you've provided for us. We want something else, and, and that thing is not a sinful thing, so it's okay. Well, it's not okay if we covet when we complain and we lust or covet after the things that God has seen good not to provide for us, we are lusting after evil things. And when we see others lusting after evil things, we need to, be, we need to note that. We need to be vigilant for this in our own lives as well. Israel did it. You and I can do it. And we need to be aware of other people if they're doing it, because that will affect us. It's easy to become discontented. Look at, or I'll read verse 7 for you, 1 Corinthians 10, 7. It says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Idolatry could be described as a form of covetousness. It's when we place something ahead of God. And in this case, they were literally worshiping an idol. Uh, that they had a, a, a graven image. Exodus 32, 6 says, They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. I, th I find it interesting that both of these verses talk about these, these elements. Eating, drinking, and playing, worshiping false gods, they're all connected with idolatry. And we need to be aware of this in, other, in, in our lives, in, in, those, in the lives of those around us. I think sometimes it's possible for us to say, well, they're my friend, I know them, I, you know, I like them, I've known them for a long time, and so these issues that I see in their life, I'm sure it'll not be a problem. I'm sure it's not, it's not an issue, but, but Paul writes, let's not be like this. This is the way these people were. And we need to be vigilant as well that we don't become like this. This is written for our learning. This is for our admonition. Lusting for evil things. Idolatry. Thirdly, 1 Corinthians 10.8 says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Look at Numbers chapter 25. We find what he's talking about here. Paul is going through Israel's history in this period, this 40-year period, or I think most, most of the time was before the, 
the 38 or so years that they spent wandering in the wilderness, most of this is leading up to their rejection of God's leadership at the borders of Canaan. And in Numbers 25, verse 1, we find about this find out about this fornication and this plague that happened. Numbers 25, verse 1, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and, and the people did eat and bowed down their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. That, now there's some fellowship here. He joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brother a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly." So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. Notice that 1 Corinthians 10 says, fell in one day twenty and three thousand, but there were twenty-four thousand total, no doubt on a different day, the other thousand to make up twenty-four thousand. But fornication, this was a serious issue. And while these people were weeping over the judgment of God, there was another man who was flaunting his fornication and flaunting his idolatry, and Eliezer took violent action, and the plague was stayed. I'm thankful that we don't have to do this sort of thing now. I try to picture being in Phineas's position, or, or these judges commanded by Moses to take the lives of their fellow uh, Israelites, and, and it's, a, it's a very sad thing. It's, it was a very different time, and God was, was presiding over all of this. And so we don't try to judge God or judge these people from our own perspective in 2024, but we do know that God commanded this, and, and we do, I, I know that I'm glad I, I don't have to do this sort of thing to carry out God's judgment this way. But it shows us how serious God is about these things. And we need to be just as serious. You know, in our world today, fornication, you talk about, about immorality in various forms. Between acts of the body and acts of the mind, there is the potential for sexual immorality all around us. Every single day, it is a constant threat and a constant temptation. And you and I have to be vigilant against it in our own lives for our own sake. For our walk with God, we can't even begin to go down that road. One step down that road is one step too far. Stay as far away from it as you possibly can. It was, it was right for people to die because they engaged in that sin here in Numbers 25. It's a very serious thing. And if we fellowship with people that we know are engaged in that, and oh yeah, you know, they're struggling. I hope they get victory over it. But you know, it's not going to affect our fellowship. It's not going to affect me it has to affect you. It will affect you. We need to be on guard against this. It's a constant threat. Sadly, our world makes, makes fun of these things, makes jokes about them, thinks that it's acceptable, thinks that it's normal. They should not be overlooked or ignored in any context. This, these things are very serious. Lusting after the wrong things, idolatry, fornication, it's very, very serious. These things displease God, and they bring one's overthrow. Again, 1 Corinthians 10.5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And if God is very displeased with these sorts of things, we also ought to be displeased with them. We can't allow them. I think of the the story of the Trojan horse and how it was brought into the fort under, under the guise of something else. It, it, it looked harmless, and it brought the, the downfall of the enemy. These things can sneak into our lives, and we think it's not a problem. We think we can manage it, or we think someone else can manage it, and we overlook it, and we take it lightly. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, 9, we find that these Hebrews were guilty of tempting God and tempting Christ. It says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. And we find that account in Numbers chapter 21. Turn over there. Numbers chapter 21. Let's look at verse 1. Tempting the Lord. It's a very serious thing. Numbers 21.1, And when King Arad of the, uh, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. Notice this, And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people unto my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. So God gives great victory. They prayed a prayer. They said, God will do this if you'll give us the victory. And God did, and they did. It was a great victory. Verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way and the people spake against God and against Moses wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness for there is no bread neither is there any water and our soul loatheth this light bread again complaining about manna complaining that God wanted to just kill them well he just gave them victory and I'm sure we're talking days or maybe weeks that have elapsed but God has, God has already given them victory. He's preserved them all these years. Verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And this is a, a wonderful picture of Christ. Look and live. As Moses, as, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But this all came about because they were tempting the Lord. And this tempting is wrong. What, what is it? How would we describe this tempting? Well, it's challenging God's character by demanding that he supply our wants. Psalm 78, 18 is talking about this. And it says, And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and it was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Challenging God's character by demanding that he supply our wants. And, and we do this, um, hopefully not the saints, but lost people can do this. You know, if God is really God, he's going to have to do this for me. You know, if God's really good, he's going to have to accomplish this. He's going to have to prove it to me. Challenging God's character to, by, to, in order to meet our demands. Contrast tempting God this way with what the Bible calls proving God or testing God. He invites us to prove him and test him. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Test me, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. What, what's the difference? Tempting God, which brings his wrath, and proving him, which brings his blessing. What's, what's the difference? How do you know the difference? Well, one is challenging his character. If God is really what he says he is, he's going to do this for me. That's tempting God. Proving God is obeying him. When we tempt him, we say, God, do what I want, and then I'll trust you. When we prove him, God says to us, here's how you prove me 
Obey me and put my promises to the test. You obey me first and watch me keep my promises. Yet we say, God, you do what I want first and then I'll trust you. If you're good, if you're who you say you are, you'll do what I want and then I'll give you faith, which is what you want, so to speak. God says, no, you obey me and, and test my promises. See if, they'll, see if they'll come true, which they always do. Again, we need to be aware of this because you might know somebody that lives this way. It's a serious thing. We can fall into this trap. We need to be vigilant against these things. Fifthly, another sin that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 10, it says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Again, why are, we, why are we talking about these sins? Because if we fellowship with people who are overcome by, by these sins and others, that fellowship will, will be a vehicle to bring those things into our lives. We will be affected by that. And we will be pulled down into that sin as well. This word murmur means to grumble, to complain, to utter complaints, in a low, half-articulated voice, to utter sullen discontent with, at, or before the thing which is the cause of discontent. And you and I, have, we've all seen this at some point. Oh, I just wish I, you know, I wouldn't really want to judge. You know people are muttering. They're murmuring. And it's, it's this odd, I don't know, I think a passive-aggressive sort of thing. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's look at Numbers chapter 14. This is a dangerous thing. And if you're fellowshipping with somebody that engages in that, it will affect you. It will infect you at some point. We need to be aware of these things. We need to address them. And we'll talk about how to, how to live, how to make choices in response to these things. But these are just some of the sins that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 10 that Israel was guilty of. Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And you might say, I think we've already read this story tonight. No, this is a different passage, but it's the same basic issue. Verse 3, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain. Let us return into Egypt. This was the point at which the twelve spies, ten of the twelve spies said, There's giants in Canaan. We can't conquer it. We're going to die. We, we're we're going we're gonna to be defeated. And again, you might say, I, I think we read this already tonight. Well, it's because the Bible contains several times that Israel murmured. They murmured a lot. In Exodus 15, they murmured about a lack of water. In Exodus 16, they murmured about meat and bread that they wanted to eat. In Exodus 17, they murmured about water again. In Numbers 14, they murmured about conquering Canaan, and they thought it was impossible like we just read. Numbers 16, there was murmuring in connection with the episode relating to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, which was about spiritual authority and God's leadership. There was murmuring here and murmuring there and murmuring here, and and they were destroyed of the destroyer, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. This is a serious sin. And there are several issues, spiritual issues at work when murmuring is going on. There is discontent. And discontent says, God's not meeting my needs. God is failing because I am not in a situation that I should be in. I do not have everything that I need. God's not giving it to me. And so God's failing. Ultimately, it's God's failure. That's what discontent says. There's resentment. I don't get what I deserve. I don't get what I need. And so I'm upset about it. I resent it. There's rebellion, which is shown by attitudes and words. I'm murmuring. I'm speaking against. There's rebellion in my heart. I'm speaking against what's, what somebody is doing. Now, you might not agree, but if once you decide to talk about it, even in a, in a hushed tone, you are voicing and acting upon rebellion. Then there's hypocrisy. 
because you're not speaking out. You're not going to that person and saying, I have some concerns. Can I talk to you? You know, it seems like there sh it should be something different here. Can we, can we discuss this? You're just murmuring. You're talking. You're undermining. You're, gr you're complaining and grumbling. There's this hypocrisy. You're not willing to actually stand up and own it, or I'm not willing if I'm murmuring. It's, 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 it's mumbled. It's, it's quiet. You're not being open about it, but you're not really hiding it either. Half-suppressed rebellion. Murmuring is a direct opposite of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those sound familiar, don't they? Murmuring is the exact opposite of those things. Even if you or I or someone else seems to have a logical criticism, yeah, you know, you make a good point, I see what you're saying, that does not make murmuring godly. God judges murmuring. Paul says they were destroyed of the destroyer. These people murmured and they murmured and they murmured and they were judged and they murmured and they were plagued and they murmured. We need to be vigilant for ourselves as well. It's easy. It's easy when you are with somebody that you feel safe, a close friend, a family member, whoever, it's easy to just let a complaint out and, and kind of cloak it with a laugh. Yeah, you know, be, say something sarcastic and then, and then chuckle. I'm, you know, I, I know, it's, I'm just not that big a deal. I'm just complaining a little bit. And we justify. We're, we're, we're explaining away. We're, we're, we're saying it's no big deal. We're minimizing it. But we can, we can be encouraging this murmuring attitude. You know, we don't look to secular studies to prove the Bible to be correct. Even if secular studies disagreed with the Bible, we would still trust the Bible. But I do think it's fascinating every once in a while when, we, when I read about a secular study that supports what the Bible teaches. I read one not too long ago talking about anger. And you maybe have heard of these rage rooms, these anger rooms that have cropped up in recent years and it's supposed to help people be more healthy and let their anger out by giving them a place where they can destroy things and they set up this room to look like a real living room or something with this furniture and everything and you you can pay to go to these rooms and and lose your temper and i don't know i've never been in one but i assume they give you a chain a chainsaw or a sledgehammer or something and you can destroy things and that's what it's for you go in there and you you destroy things but what they found and I'm glad you're all sitting down because you're really going to be surprised about this. What they found is when you, when you vent like that, it actually doesn't help you become less angry of a person. It actually makes you become more of an angry person. You know what they found helps you become less angry of a person? When you actually calm yourself down. And you don't give place unto the devil. You don't give place unto wrath. Interesting how the Bible is proven true yet again. But we can do that with complaining and murmuring. You know, it just, I just had to get it off my chest. Did you? Did I? No, I felt like getting it off my chest. That didn't glorify the Lord. I was talking with someone recently and I was, I was trying to be careful with how I said something to them because it related to them and I said, I don't want to offend you. And they said, oh, it's okay, you won't offend me. And I said, no, I want to be careful. I'm not just concerned about you. I want to say what my Heavenly Father wants me to say. That's, our, that's what our focus ought to be. I'm with a safe group. I can say whatever I want. No, because the Heavenly Father is watching. Let's, let's be sure to say only what He wants us to say. Let's, let's not give place unto wrath. Let's not give place unto complaining. Let's not murmur. That's what Israel did. And let's not fellowship with people who are murmurers, who are idolaters, who are fornicators, who are lusting. These are things that we need to be aware of. It's important. We need to be vigilant. If you, find, if you find that these spiritual issues are existing in the lives of others, what do, what do we do about that? 
you have to know, you must know, you need to know that your fellowship with them will sow the seeds of those sins in your own heart. Oh, I, you know, yeah, they have some problems, but it won't affect me. Yes, it will affect you. It will affect me. We have two choices in that instance. You might need to restore them, as Galatians 6, 1 says. Look, friend, I notice that these things restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. I'm concerned for you. Can I help you? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being superior over here. I, I, I'm the same, I have the same sinful tendencies here. I care for you. Let me address, can, we, can, can we address these things? You might need to restore them, or you might need to avoid them. Romans 16, 17 talks about that. But you cannot fellowship with them. We need to be warned. Because Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You and I have the same tendencies. This is written so that we can learn from their mistakes because we can make the same ones. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. We need to flee from these things. But we need to be aware that these things can affect us. When we, when we allow this, these issues to come in through fellowship, it's, it's, like, we're, it's like we're injecting um, infection and viruses and all kinds of things, bacteria, into our body and expecting that it's not going to affect us. These spiritual issues do spread and multiply. We can be defeated from fellowship. We need to be careful about these things. Let's, all, let's talk for a, a moment about discouragement from fellowship. Not only can sin in fellowship defeat us, but we can be discouraged as an indirect result of fellowship. Fellowship, and this is how it works, fellowship builds relationships between people. God intends for that to happen. It builds relationships. Close relationships make both parties vulnerable to be hurt. God designed it that way. When you're close with somebody, they have a greater ability to hurt you, and you them. That's the way God designed it. When relationships are damaged or severed, one or both of parties in that relationship are hurt, and often deeply. This is how it works. That deep hurt, which was made possible by fellowship that existed before the hurt, we sort of put ourselves in that position, when that hurt, that, that deep hurt can cause a person then to avoid future fellowship. Well, I got into this relationship and then it was damaged or severed. I'm not doing that again. And we can become discouraged because now we don't have any fellowship or we're afraid of fellowship or maybe we're just cynical about it. We can be discouraged. And, and, and we would say, where did this all start? Well, it, it started because we fellowshiped and had these relationships. But this is how we can have a twisted view of it. It just hurts me. It just opens me up to be hurt. I'm not going to do that again. But that's not a right perspective. It's true that we cannot avoid all hurt in life. We cannot keep damaged or severed relationships from occurring at some point in our life. If you've, if you've lived for any appreciable length in this, uh, in this life, you have experienced damaged or severed relationships of some kind. This is part of, of human life. And it's not, it's, it's not um, something that we can't affect. We can make good choices and limit that. But we'll never fully... Uh, escape it or avoid it completely. We'll never get through life from beginning to end and never have this happen to us. This is, this is part of life on this sin-cursed planet. But we can choose to not be discouraged when it does happen. We can refuse to put up a wall and avoid future fellowship. We can refuse to do that, to put up that wall. 
we can refuse to be afraid of fellowship and vulnerability. We can refuse to be cynical about fellowship. Just because things were painful and difficult doesn't mean we should conclude the wrong things about something that God ordained, which is fellowship. He created it. So how do we, how do, we do this? How do we avoid discouragement from fellowship? Turn back to 1 Corinthians 10. Maybe you're already there. We'll go through this part quickly. We can be discouraged because of things that happen in our fellowship or, or as a result of our fellowship, and it can make us think wrongly about fellowship, but we shouldn't let it. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't let it change right behavior towards fellowship and regarding fellowship. 1 Corinthians 10, 15 says, I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. It's good for us to remember that true wisdom always keeps God in the picture. When we start to put up a wall to protect ourselves, we start being cynical about something like fellowship, we're not being wise because we're taking God out of the picture. I have to protect myself because God isn't going to. Yeah, God says fellowship is good, but I know better. First Corinthians, look at verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. First of all, how do, how do we avoid discouragement from fellowship? We need to remember that fellowship begins at the cross. In, in salvation, we have fellowship with the Lord. And after salvation, we have fellowship with others who have been saved. Their fellowship with the Lord began at the cross. Our fellowship with the Lord begins at the cross. And we have fellowship with each other because we've both been to the cross. That's what fellowship is founded upon primarily and, and in its most basic form. Fellowship exists because of Christ. It doesn't exist for our companionship it doesn't exist for our synergy or our pleasure. Those are benefits, but they aren't the purpose. The purpose of fellowship is to bring glory to Christ. And that begins at salvation. And you and I must make God's glory the purpose of our fellowship always. Always. We cannot glorify God if the elements of our fellowship or the results of our fellowship are in opposition to the body and blood of Christ. And this is why sin has to be addressed and removed uh, as, or avoided as, as the situation calls for because we cannot fellowship and bring glory to God if there's sin involved. If there's sin polluting it and corrupting it, I can't say that I'm walking with God when I'm indulging my sin on the side. I can't come to church and act like everything's great when I'm hiding my sin and going home and doing more of it and loving it and, and seeking after it. I can't fellowship in a godly way with others because God is not glorified. I am the focus in that scenario. God's glory needs to be the purpose of our fellowship. Of course, it's not wrong to feel pain when relationships are damaged. That's normal. But discouragement happens when we focus on self. This is so hard, I guess it'll never be any better. I guess I'll just have to do this for my, to protect myself. I guess I'll just and we become discouraged. Just, just the word discourage, it means we lose our courage. And if God is in the picture, we don't need to be discouraged. It's easy to say, we don't, the Christian doesn't ever have to be discouraged. And I condemn myself when I say that because I've been discouraged. And I'm sure there will be another point in my life when I am discouraged. But we don't need to be discouraged. God is in the picture. And God's glory is the purpose of our fellowship, and that is always possible. So whatever's happened in the past, let's not get discouraged over it. Let's say, I'm going to glorify the Lord today or tomorrow with my fellowship. I'm going to make that my purpose. Verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar. What say I then, that the idol is anything? For, look at verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? There's a lot here, 
And, I, and we won't take the time to talk all about this, but, but he's talking about sacrificing unto, unto false gods, unto idols. The idols are just statues. They're nothing. But these Gentiles are worshiping, what they're actually worshiping are demons. And so we can't have fellowship with, with the, in, in, you know, meats offered to idols. He, he references that earlier in 1 Corinthians. But he's talking about their, their worship. An idol is nothing. It's just a statue. We understand this. It's not a real god. But they're worshiping demons, and we can't fellowship with that. The point that Paul is making in, this, in these few verses here is about holiness. And this is a focus that we can have in our fellowship. Okay, I don't need to be discouraged. Instead, I can consecrate myself to God. This is something that I can do. This is something that I can focus on. True fellowship can only happen with Christ's blessing. We need to be in fellowship with Him, and that comes through holiness and consecration because we love him and and we've gone through some of these painful things and so what do we do after that do we protect ourselves do we keep everybody at arm's length or do we remember what fellowship ought to be about it's about bringing glory to god well how do i do that i i i consecrate myself to him Anything I say, everything I say, everything I do ought to be for his honor and for his glory. And I'm going to find people that live that way too. That's what fellowship is about. As we read, we won't read them all for sake of time. But verse 23, Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And he goes on to talk, let no, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. In other words, be mindful of what other people are thinking and don't, don't offend their conscience. Don't do things that they think are objectionable and cause them to be distressed and, and, and offended because of this. They, others need edification. And this is a focus that we can have in the aftermath of, of painful um, relationships and so on is to remember that others need edification and really we're getting back to the focus of of what my fellowship and, and you for your fellowship what that should be about what, what am i trying to get out of fellowship we've we understand what it is we've talked about what it's based on and the blessings of it but as i invest myself in fellowship what should i be focused on is this just let's have enjoy an enjoyable time let's have fun let's let's do let's let's meet my needs here or should i be investing in in other people's lives it, it starts at the the cross and it happens when I am set apart and consecrated to God but others need edification how can I invest myself in others how can I go fellowship with others and edify them and exhort them and help them walk with God more effectively giving rather than receiving Acts 20 35 Paul says I or uh, yeah, Paul is saying this. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so as we seek fellowship, seek to edify, seek to exhort, seek to encourage. There's always somebody at any given point, there's always someone who could use some encouragement, who could use some edification. Providing this will lift your spirits and help you not to be discouraged. It's a blessing to give this, to, to seek to help others through fellowship. We use the word fellowship to mean, a lot of times, to mean, you know, leisure and fun. But we ought to be looking at it as making a spiritual investment. How can I make a spiritual investment? How am I able to do this? Well, only because of the cross. Only because I'm living consecrated in a holy life, set apart unto God. Not, not perfect and sinless, but, but set apart. I, I am dedicated to glorify God. And if I sin, I'm going to repent of it immediately and set myself apart unto God again. But I'm going to invest myself in others. I'm going to edify others. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians 10.33 says, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Remember the gospel. It all begins and ends with the gospel. 
Paul says, I want to edify others. I want to be aware of what Israel was guilty of. Because if I start living according to the flesh and I start doing these things, it's going to affect the, the power and the effectiveness of the gospel. And people aren't going to be saved like they could be. My testimony is not going to be what it ought to be. We may endure pain and heartache in connection with fellowship, but we don't need to be de defeated and discouraged as long as the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This is our purpose. We're here that many may be saved. The profit of many, that's what we're seeking. The profit of others, the glory of God. This is the, the end goal of fellowship. Fellowship is good, but it must always be pleasing to God. Our godly fellowship, again, I'm not talking about being a friend to a person who needs the gospel. I'm not talking about showing the love of Christ to a lost person. I'm not calling that fellowship. I'm talking about godly, biblical fellowship between saints. That fellowship must be with people who are godly and must exclude things that are ungodly. Otherwise, our fellowship will easily bring our spiritual defeat and maybe God's judgment on us, as it did Israel. We can be easily discouraged as a result of fellowship because relationships can be damaged at times. But rather than avoiding future fellowship as a safety mechanism, personal safety mechanism, we should remember that fellowship begins at the cross when we got saved. It reminds us that fellowship is about Christ's glory and not about us. We should remember that our gl holiness glorifies Christ, and that's always true, no matter what happens in our human relationships. We can always live and stand for Christ and separate ourselves for His glory. We must remember that others need edification. Seeking fellowship for others' sake gives fellowship a sweet and exciting purpose. And above all, we must remember the gospel. It's the reason for our fellowship with Christ. It is the reason for our fellowship with other saints. And it is the reason for our future fellowship with those who are currently lost. Keep sowing the seed. The Lord will bless you with fellowship while you are engaged in service to him. Let's focus on him. Let's focus on glorifying him, serving him, pleasing him, and we'll avoid these dangers of fellowship. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to consider these things. We skipped and, and didn't have time to consider some of these verses in 1 Corinthians 10, but I pray that you would help us to be sober-minded about these things. Help us to seek to glorify you in all that we do. It's so easy for self to insert and, and push in and become the object of what we do, but Lord, you ought to be the object of what we do, to do all to the glory of God. Help us to live this way in every area of our lives, including our fellowship. I pray that you would bless our fellowship tonight and coming up over the weekend. I pray that we would honor and glorify you with all that we say and do, how we edify each other, how we exhort each other, how we judge the sin in our own life, and if necessary, how we seek to restore a brother or sister in Christ. I pray that you'd be honored in all of this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.